In Pokemon games, we get a glimpse into the world of these creatures from the perspective of a trainer. Someone who cares only really about the aspects of Pokemon as relate to catching, breeding, and battle. But these are living creatures that exist as part of an ecosystem, most of which is obscured by that lens. I want to look into the world of Pokemon, and use this limited data to create a sort of ecological analysis of the Pokemon, filling in the gaps and rationalizing certain odd and interesting aspects. That's a pretty large task, so today I'm only going to be looking at the first few areas of the Kanto region, Pallet Town to Pewter City specifically. So some upkeep. Whenever you do any sort of analysis of a piece of media for any reason, you have to decide what is and isn't abstraction, and thus what is and isn't relevant. I think it's best to explain with an example. How does an egg hatch in Pokemon? Well, if you walk around with it, it'll hatch after X number of steps. So is that actually how eggs work in the Pokemon universe? They hatch by someone carrying them around for a certain distance? No, of course not. The step count is an abstract representation of time in games that don't always keep track of it. As such, I don't think fixating on the oddity of literally interpreting that would be of much value. Types, moves, stats, abilities, evolutions, all that I'm going to be taking into account when analyzing these creatures, but there are a few things I'll be ignoring. Relative levels of Pokemon between areas is very clearly a game design decision to have a nice progression. While that could be rationalized, I don't think it would be very interesting to do so. I may look at relative level within a given area though. Another thing is the Pokedex entries. I'll be looking at them, but by no means am I setting myself up to feel obliged to treat them as anything other than some nonsense a 10 year old wrote. Some of them are bonkers. The biggest question though is how we interpret the many different versions of these areas. There are 12 different games in which you can visit most of them, and not all of them are the same. The easiest ones to explain are the Johto games. They're clearly sequels which take place after the Kanto games, and as such the differences are explained by the passage of time, and the introduction of new invasive species. Because of that, I'm not really going to be looking at the golds and silvers now, as they display a different ecosystem, one that is currently in flux due to recent changes of these new additions. For the rest though, we then have to ask, what do these differences represent? One answer is a multiverse solution, which is both a cop-out and not a perfect answer. In some ways it can make sense, we can see version exclusives as Pokemon that could fill the same ecological niche, but in different worlds different species got lucky. Growlithe and Vulpix are both fire type similarly sized canids, and as such could serve the same role in their environment. On the other hand though, you have things like the Nidorans, which, why would one sex of a species be more successful in certain situations? That doesn't make sense. They should live or die together. <laughs> At the end of it, it's just not a very interesting solution. It's basically just saying a Pokemon wizard did it. My more fun hypothesis of representation is that different versions are different times of the year. The exclusives, as well as other Pokemon that are more or less common between versions, can then be explained by all sorts of mechanisms, such as migration and spawning habits. My current working seasonal timeline, based on the areas I'll be looking at today, is that the games are in this order, likely ranging from early spring to late fall, or potentially winter. The specifics of when isn't exactly necessary, only that there are seasonal differences which cause changes in distribution. As I go further into the game, we'll see if this hypothesis continues to make sense. Note this doesn't mean that all the games take place in one year, just that they're all set in different months. Also, for stat and move differences of Pokemon, I'll be viewing things simply as different possibilities that could be caused by environmental or genetic factors. Even if that isn't the correct explanation, that doesn't change that each game is a snapshot of the environment, and no matter the cause, variation in that snapshot can be observed and compared to learn things about the species within them. That's to say, the order doesn't necessarily matter for all my points. I'm also excluding the Let's Go games because they actually do canonically take place in an alternate universe with Mega Evolution. With that, it's time to begin the analysis. Route 1, where everything begins. In all the games I'm looking at, the only Pokemon to find here are Pidgey and Rattata, though over time they do have slightly different relative densities. Following along my seasonal hypothesis, we see a significant drop in Rattatats in yellow. 
Again, this could be because of a number of reasons. Yellow could take place closer to winter, in which case the Rattatam might start emigrating away or preparing for winter, or it could be that Pidgeys spawn in great number at an earlier point in the year, and this is when they leave their nests, resulting in a large increase in sightings. A side note about sampling. When drawing conclusions from the information of spawn rates of Pokémon, there's a lot of things that we need to take into account. For example, the 50-50 split of Rattata and Pidgey here doesn't necessarily mean that their numbers are equal. This is because these numbers are effectively observed sampling, a person just walking through the environment. In real life, when sampling animals, many potential biases need to be accounted for. In this scenario, the more able and likely a Pokémon is to avoid humans, the lower its percent will be, whereas slow Pokémon or those who are familiar with and calm around humans may have higher numbers. This means we can't take the spawn rates as literal amounts relative to other Pokémon. However, we can draw conclusions based on how spawn rates of specific Pokémon change between areas in games. That Route one's ratio goes from near 50-50 Rattata to Pidgey to 30-70 means there's a significant change in the relative distribution, but it could be caused by a number of things. Rattata numbers could have dropped, Pidgey numbers could have risen, or a little bit of both. The winner for me here is a little bit of both. In adjacent areas such as Route 2 and 22, we see similar drops in Rattata populations in yellow. As further support, Pikachu, which live in the adjacent Viridian Forest and are similarly sized, similarly statted rodents, see a similar drop in yellow, showing that this might be a trend for a like species. At the same time, Pidgeys spread into Viridian Forest, effectively showing an increase in their distribution. Also of note is that the drop doesn't necessarily even mean that there are fewer Rattatat in the area, just that they aren't seen as often. Thus, these rats could simply be hiding away in dens for the winter, coming out and thus being seen less frequently. An important takeaway from this is that Pidgeys and Rattatats can coexist quite well in the same area. This is an important aspect of figuring out these ecosystems, looking at which species can or cannot coexist, which can tell us about each species' niche in relation to others. And when it comes to niches, the most important aspect is food. Rattatats' normal type would suit it well to being a generalist, and one key to their success likely lies in Hyperfang, which it learns very early for its power. That along with Super Fang would make Rattatat good at breaking through highly defensive foods such as shelled nuts or animals. We don't see any of those here though, hmm. On the other hand, moves like Quick Attack and Pursuit would be useful for chasing down fast prey. What are these prey? Well, they might be Pidgey, but they're more likely smaller animals that live in the area. Two animals doesn't make a stable system, and as such we need other creatures to fill in the gaps. These creatures are likely, for one reason or another, insignificant to a Pokémon trainer, and as such, aren't seen. Though that likely means Hyperfang still isn't being put to use. On Pidgey's side, we see moves like Whirlwind, Feather Dance, and Sand Attack. Very defensive moves, which would allude to the idea that they spend a lot of energy preventing predation. Could this be from Rattatat? Any other animal in the area that could prey on Pidgeys would likely be too significant for a trainer to ignore. I think it is the rats, but not in a straightforward way. Notably, these defensive moves aren't ways of escaping, but instead things that allow Pidgey to stand their ground in the face of a predator, as if they needed to defend something, like eggs. I think Rattatat prey upon the eggs of birds like Pidgey. They're too flightless to really properly hunt a bird, but a nest presents a great opportunity. Pidgey have thus developed strategies for protecting their nest, so that's why Rattatat and Pidgey can coexist. Rattatat hunt Pidgey eggs, along with other creatures, and Pidgey are pretty good at defending them. For Pidgey's food, at first glance you may think that their flying type would encourage them into insectivory and herbivory. After all, if flying moves are much more effective against such creatures, they should have a distinct edge when hunting them. However, while they probably do feed on bugs and plants, they don't always have a flying move to take advantage of that. Instead, what separates their diet from Rattatat is probably more simple. The fact that they can fly gives them access to different food sources. They can eat berries and nuts directly off of bushes and trees, while the rats can search for food in the debris and grass of the fields and forests. At the same time, Pidgeys get the generalist advantage of focusing on normal moves, but that would only give them an edge against electric types. Hmm. Rattatat can also coexist with Spearow. Well, as far as I know, there's only one area in the game where Pidgeys and Spearows cohabitate. From this near-perfect exclusion, it's clear to see that Pidgeys and Spearows fill the same niche, and Rattatat likely have a similar relationship with each of them. But how do the two birds differ? What determines which regions are Pidgey-dominated and which regions are Spearow-dominated? The decks would suggest it's based on the terrain. 
Pidgeys in fields, Spearows in rocky environments. But I think there's more to it than simply that. Looking at their movesets, we see that Pidgey, once again, have the more defensive moves, while Spearows learn more offensive moves with Leer, Pursuit, and Drill Peck. At a glance, that may make you think that Spearows are hunters while Pidgey are prey, which would imply different niches, but that's not necessarily what this means. They simply have different strategies that would be beneficial in different areas. As I showed, Pidgey seem to have behaviors for protecting their young. Mature Pidgeots, or Pidgeotto, may provide protection and food to them. Thus, they wouldn't need offensive moves, at least not early on. Meanwhile, Spearow do need it, and they get Flying Type Peck at level 1 to give them an edge for hunting bugs and such. On top of that, Spearow have higher stats on average, specifically in attack and speed. Spearow much earlier are more capable of defending and hunting for themselves, and they might need to if Mature Firo don't spend as much time caring for them. Overall, I think the areas are differentiated in terms of volatility, which is a fairly common distinction of strategy in ecology. Spearows live in volatile environments, which change frequently, have many dangerous Pokémon, and where you have to grow quickly in order to survive. Pidgey live in more consistent environments with stable food sources and fewer predators. This also means that Pidgey likely outcompete Spearow in these stable environments for one reason or another, excluding them from these safer areas. So that's why Pidgey and Spearows don't share space. But why is Pidgey only in Viridian Forest at certain times? After all, the presence of bug Pokémon is probably an excellent source of food. Their presence seems to coincide with a drop in the presence of both Beedrill and Pikachu. Pikachu immediately makes some sense, since as flying types it makes sense for them to be wary of electric types, hence perhaps that normal move focus over flying. As well, due to how poison works, it makes sense that Weedles might also present a threat. If poison is a guaranteed death sentence without healing like it is in these games, then hunting Weedles, while potentially rewarding, poses a great risk. Caterpie is a much safer prey. Meanwhile, the variation and presence of Caterpie and Weedle seems pretty straightforward to me. They simply spawn at different points in the year, Weedle early and Caterpie later. They likely grew this trend to avoid competition with each other as larvae. With how prominent they are and the fact that they fully evolve very early, they're almost definitely full-on R strategists. Though specific features of theirs differ, they overall have the same life plan. The larvae are very weak and spend their time collecting food, they soon after form a cocoon for protection and to metamorphosize into an adult, which can defend itself. The one oddity that disconnects this plan from its real-life counterparts is the fact that they can reproduce as larvae, or as cocoons, which is a little odd, but whatever. The question then is how related the two families are. Is this divergent or convergent evolution? Side note, divergent evolution refers to when species differentiate. This would be the case if Butterfree and Beedrill share a common ancestor which had a similar larva and cocoon strategy, and thus it would be a homologous trait. Convergent evolution is when two animals evolve in similar ways to fill the same niche. This would be the case if the pair's ancestor did not share the cocoon and complete metamorphosis strategy, and in this case it would be an analogous trait. The fact that there are many bug-type Pokémon which have this trait alludes to the idea that this may have been something developed long in the past, long enough that some Pokémon have lost it. And as such, I think this trait represents a wide family of Pokémon, which includes both Butterfree and Beedrill, but also many others, some of which may not even show this trait completely. Venomoth, for example, may not have a cocoon stage, but there's no denying it goes through a significant amount of metamorphosis. This explanation allows for this similarity, while also rationalizing the great differences in the two species. For food, the larvae are obviously herbivorous. As adults, they likely retain this. Beedrill could exist beyond its larva's distribution and prey upon Caterpie or maybe even Pikachu, and they may opportunistically do so, but there's little evidence to suggest this beyond the move Pursuit. Moves like Rage and Endeavor and the ability Swarm suggest a more retaliatory behavior, as they would come in handy for a Pokémon backed into a corner. There's also them as food. They spread out into the adjacent route too, where they're likely preyed upon by the Rattatat and Pidgey, though due to their small number, they're probably only a supplemental food source. Then there's of course their more consistent forest roommate, Pikachu. The final comparable pair of Pokémon here is Rattatat and Pikachu. Being similarly sized and statted rodents, it would make sense that they would have a lot in common. The one area that Pikachu live in doesn't include Rattatat, and that's somewhat unusual considering the latter's abundance. Due to this, the rats likely outcompete the Pikachus, forcing them into unideal environments, somewhat similar to how Pidgeys likely do to Spearow. So why is Viridian Forest the Pikachu holdout? Because of Weedle. They pose a threat to the rats, creating a space that is not suitable for them. It's not ideal for the Pikachu either, but the outcompeted can't be choosers. 
It's not all doom and gloom for the Pikachu, though. There's evidence to suggest that rather than the coffin for a dying presence, Viridian Forest is actually a unique niche that may have turned Pikachu into what they are. It comes down to their electric typing. Pikachu is unique in that it's one of the only Pokémon in this area to learn special moves, the only others being Butterfree's Confusion, and sort of Pidgey's Gust in later generations. While Metapod and Kakuna's hardening makes them well defended against physical predation, like that of a bird or potentially rat, it doesn't help against Thundershock. Pikachu would have an easy time preying upon the helpless Chrysalis Pokémon. Pikachu, like Rattatat, see a drop in presence in the later parts of the year, strengthening the connection between the two, but also meaning that their departure coincides with Caterpie's rise, which makes a lot of sense. With the presence of an Electric-type Predator, Flying-type Butterfree would be at risk, and spawning later, when they're not around, lets them avoid this. Beedrill, on the other hand, seem perfectly suited for dealing with Pikachu, lacking the Flying-type and having a rather high special defense. It's unusually its second highest stat. These Beedrill have clearly adapted to the presence of Pikachu, becoming more resilient to their attacks so they can fight them off. So Pikachu seem to have a place and notable presence here in Verdian Forest, and it's likely been that way for a long time, since the other species have adaptations to help deal with them. On the other end, it's highly likely that the Electric type came along and was selected for because of these pressures. So if you like the fact that Pikachu aren't normal type, you probably have Kakuna and Metapod to thank. I kind of lied. The Nidos are another pair of Pokemon to examine together, but they're a special case since rather than two species, they're one with enough sexual dimorphism that they have different moves and stats. Their presence is temporary, with Route 22 exhibiting the most, and there we can explain things through migratory habits. Rather than sit around in one space throughout the year, Nidoran move around the region depending on the season. With my hypothesized order of games, males follow females. Females travel ahead to areas to settle and nest, while males follow along and, when they come to such nesting sites, compete for mates. This explains the early presence of females and later rise in males. As females pair off, they leave with their young, so the males start outnumbering the females, as the males may stay to mate with multiple females. By the next year, there are few females left with only straggler males hoping for the last chance to reproduce. Route 2, where we see just a brief presence of Nidoran, coincides with their peak presence at Route 22. This could be seen as an overflow due to said abundance. In terms of their relationship with other Pokémon, we already discussed the value of being Poison-type, and they have Poison Point on top of that, making contact with them even more dangerous. They learn Poison Sting fairly late though, instead opting for normal moves, Peck, and later on Double Kick. This lack of offensive use of Poison makes me believe that they're primarily herbivorous, with their moves used for defense or intraspecies competition for mates. The horn on the males is almost definitely a mating display, since it's only present on them. The offensive benefits are secondary. Notably, this grants them peck, giving them an edge against mankeys, which they may feed upon or simply defend themselves from. This explains why there's a drop in mankeys' presence when the Nidos arrive, they're not ideal prey. This move also could make it easy to hunt bugs, and they are near enough to Viridian Forest. Providing food for the females in the form of mankeys or butterfree may even be part of impressing mates. However, if they did go into Viridian Forest, they probably wouldn't be in luck, as the Butterfreeze that are present have psychic moves, which would pose a great threat to the poison types. Seems like a very fortunate situation for the butterflies, almost as if it's evolved. Mankey's distribution is the least supportive of my seasonal hypothesis, as they seem to leave and return multiple times. Due to the fact that they're only present here, but still fairly prominent when they are present, it's likely that they live further up in the mountains and this is the edge of their territory. Why would they come here? Well, the normal type Rattatat would likely serve as good prey from the type advantage. Then it's why do they leave? Mankey's disappearance coincides with the arrival of Nidoran. Due to the danger of the poison types and the fact that they resist Mankey's fighting type, this makes some sense. The oddity though is that they return later, there's a sharp drop in Rattata at this time, which I've already somewhat rationalized, though the drop is more significant than in other areas, likely somewhat new to Mankey's return. But that doesn't explain why they came back. Perhaps defenseless baby Nidoran present a good prey opportunity despite their poison typing, so some return. Spiro might join in on this baby buffet, but they also probably prey on monkeys, having the type advantage. I would at least say that it's highly likely that Fero prey on them. And while the Nidos are dangerous, they actually support the idea that these areas are not ideal for the birds and that Pidgeys have it better. But back to the monkeys. I'm still not satisfied with that as the reason why the monkeys return. 
One other idea though is that it could be the Pokemon in the pond in this area, with them potentially preying on. Why are there so many Pokemon living in this single pond? Okay. All the freshwater bodies across Kanto in Leaf and Fire are like this, while well, Red and Blue are a little more reasonable. On top of that, the sampling biases we see in the grass areas are magnified in the water, where fishing is the sampling method, which is impacted by factors like what bait you're using. So with that massive grain of salt, Mankey's presence seems to coincide with some increase in presence of Poliwag, which could be prey for them. Since having legs, they likely spend some time out of the water. Interestingly, the other legged aquatic creatures that live here, Psyduck and Slowpoke, both have psychic moves, which could be as a defense evolved in response to predation from the monkeys. Just like Butterfree to Nidoran. Poliwags even have Hypnosis, a psychic type move, which could allude to the idea that they may develop in a similar way in the future. I won't go any further into the aquatic Pokemon now, instead I think I'll make a specific video for the freshwater environments as a whole, and only glance into them when relevant like here. Anyways, to conclude Mankey, it's always possible that there are other factors we can't see from just this. Mankeys could be pushed down the mountain by other pressures and Pokemon that are up there, thus rationalizing this sporadic trend. But without assuming anything like that, I think this is the best explanation for why this trend exists. There's one last part of an area and Pokemon that I want to squeeze in here, that being the grass of Route 21 and the Tangela that live there. It seems more fitting to talk about it with the adjacent grass areas than the adjacent sea areas. The odd thing here is Tangela's domination in Fire and Leaf, whereas it has a more limited presence in Red and Blue Green. Tangela makes perfect sense as prey for both Pidgey and Rattata, Pidgey because of the flying type, Rattata because of the high-powered Hyper and Super Fang's ability to get through Tangela's defense. It's that missing Pokemon. These traits allude to the idea that Tangela were probably far more present in the past, but were not able to survive as prey of the bird and rat, so have become endangered, this being the only place they live in mainland Kanto. And so, my theory for why Tangela are alone in these areas is human intervention, for the purpose of keeping the Tangela population alive. The area is fenced off, with Pallet Town between it and the adjacent areas. During certain times, likely Tangela's breeding season, the people work to make sure Radta and Pidgey aren't prevented from coming into the area and disturbing the Tangela, keeping them alive. With that help, they're able to get through the other times of the year with predation on their own. Or it could be a farm, that's another possibility. In terms of their own food, their grass typing along with their chlorophyll ability and the moves ingrain and perhaps growth imply that they produce some amount of energy on their own. They may participate in some form of active predation to support this, as they seem to have a few good moves for trapping things in their vines, subduing them with status effects, and then sucking their life with absorb. They may not be very good at this, evidenced by their small number, but they seem to have the ability to do so. Another notable aspect to Tangela's typing is that it's unique to Kanto. No other grass type is monotype. This along with their seemingly endangered status could show that grass is simply not a good type to be here, and that creatures that are it either adapt or die. So that's a glimpse into the potential ecology of these areas. I found this to be an incredibly enjoyable idea to think about, so much so that I couldn't fit everything in. In particular, more details about the evolutions of these Pokemon, which I hopefully will be able to detail in the future. I also skipped over the ponds in Viridian City in Route 22, which I will again hopefully talk about in the future. By the end of this, I also hope to be able to lay out a phylogenetic tree of Pokemon, and not one where Pokemon are simply placed according to the animal they're based on, but one in which they're placed based on their own attributes. Anyways, I hope you've enjoyed this little dive into the speculative ecology of Pokemon, and maybe it made you think about Pokemon a little differently. Personally, it's given me a newfound perspective and appreciation for the series, and I'd like to share that. Thank you very much for watching.